Rick and Morty is a virtual compendium of pop culture references. From digs at Titanic to an obscure reference to National Lampoon's family vacation, the show's writers love to pay homage to what came before. But sometimes they do more than that. Sometimes they straight up steal from other shows, and we mean that in the best way possible. Uh, well... Pablo Picasso once said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And Shakespeare shamelessly stole plot lines all the time. Wow. So the writers of Rick and Morty are in good company. What we're trying to say is, please don't say mean things about us in the comments. We're just the messenger. That is way too much pressure! Now, without further ado, let's look at 10 times Rick and Morty shamelessly stole from other shows. So, Rick and Morty is not the first irreverent cartoon to mercilessly skewer pop culture. South Park did it, and Simpsons did it before them. In fact, South Park did a whole episode based on that very premise just to prove the point. Sometimes you just have to take what came before and put your own spin on it. And they've been doing it for over two decades now. Likewise, the writers of Rick and Morty have raided the annals of science fiction to power the fever dream adventures of a crazed scientist and his hapless grandson. In the season one episode, Lawnmower Dog, Rick enhances Snuffle's intellect to the point where he becomes a cybernetic tyrant bent on world domination. If that storyline seems somewhat familiar, it's because it's a similar plot to the classic 1959 novel Flowers for Algernon, where an intellectually disabled man has a surgery that transforms him into an insufferable know-it-all, just like Snuffles, without the whole world domination part. No, that part came straight from the film Lawnmower Man, about a simple gardener who becomes a megalomaniacal cyber god after his mind is enhanced by a computer. At least in Rick and Morty, Snuffles and his dog army get their own dog planet to call home. Which sounds a lot like Dog World, a show pitched by co-creator Justin Roiland back in 2012 that was ultimately rejected. Wow, a whole world populated by intelligent dogs. If there's one contemporary show that bears a striking resemblance to Rick and Morty, it's Cartoon Network's The Venture Bros. Premiering back in 2004, the show followed Dr. Rusty Venture, his bodyguard Brock, and his two homeschooled sons as they stumbled through a series of endlessly bloody misadventures. Go Team Venture! Including one where the boys are miniaturized and injected into their father to search for a chronic ailment. Not unlike the time Morty was shrunk down and shot into the guts of a homeless man where Rick had built an amusement park. Because nothing is sacred to Rick Sanchez. Granted, both of these are referencing the iconic Fantastic Voyage, but the similarities between the two shows don't stop there. Dr. Venture, like Rick, is a mad scientist who regularly puts his sons in dangerous situations, which often leads to their death. And when that happens, he replaces them with clones, not unlike how Rick is theorized to have replaced Morty with one from a different dimension. Did we have some sort of relationship with him? Both shows feature countless pop culture references, a parade of whimsical secondary characters, copious acts of violence, and a host of daddy issues. Okay, I got him. They're in... they're in his prostate. So how do we get him out? But wait, there's more! Rick and Morty has poached storylines from more than one episode of Venture Bros. In the season 4 finale, Operation Prom, Dr. Venture's repeated rejection by women leads him to create a love potion that, once activated, transforms people into mantis-like creatures that turn ravenous. That's right, some four years before Rick Cronenberg the whole world, Dr. Venture almost did the same thing. Fortunately for the Ventures and the rest of humanity, the infection didn't spread on a global scale as Brock Samson, their OSI-trained murder machine, put an end to the creatures in classic Brock fashion. With a giant friggin' knife! Maybe if Rick employed his services, they wouldn't have had to skip town and start all over in a replacement dimension. There are some striking differences, however, between the two protagonists. Whereas Rick is the smartest guy in the universe, Dr. Venture is a trust fund baby living off of his father's legacy, perpetually on the edge of bankruptcy. But there are multiple dimensions in the Venture universe, and one features a super successful version of Rusty Venture. So I guess what we're saying is, Rusty is like the Rick that eats his own poop. I'm disgusted that my good name is being used for this… this baloney! Rest and Rick Laxation may not be our favorite episode, but it does have one of the best cold opens ever. After Rick pulls Morty out of a class for a quick 20-minute adventure, which spirals out of control into an epic space opera culminating in a nervous breakdown for our interdimensional adventurers, they go to a spa to detoxify. And detox they do. Literally. 
their personalities split in two, with a toxic Rick and Morty and a non-toxic Rick and Morty. While Rick and his counterpart try to merge the alter egos, non-toxic Morty goes on a total ego trip and becomes a high-powered broker a la the Wolf of Wall Street, but with significantly fewer prostitutes and barbiturates. The idea of dueling personas is an old one, from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde to the Nutty Professor and even Family Matters. But Rick and Morty is not the first animated show to use it. It also serves as a plot in Dexter's Laboratory. In the episode Dr. Dee Dee and Dexter Hyde, the titular character creates a good and bad version of himself and his sister Dee Dee. And just like in Rest and Relaxation, Dexter and Dee Dee have to merge with their other selves and restore the status quo. Anybody who's ever watched a couple episodes of Rick and Morty knows it owes a debt of gratitude to Back to the Future. The iconic time-traveling adventure from 1985 about a hapless teen, his bad scientist friend, and, uh, uh, incest. Because the 1980s were a very different time. When, uh, when incest jokes were funny, we guess. We... we don't know. But when I kiss you, it's like I'm kissing... My brother. Like Rick, Doc Brown is unscrupulous in his pursuit of super science and deals with some unsavory characters. In this case, a band of Libyan terrorists. Did we not mention there's a subplot with terrorists because there totally is? I think we can all agree that this is a total Rick move. But Doc is not a total dick towards Marty. After all, he does help him get back to the future instead of letting him die on a giant frog planet. Like Rick might have done. No, to understand the dynamic of Rick and Morty, we have to go further back to another time-traveling duo, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, which follows the time-traveling adventures of a know-it-all scientist and his hapless sidekick. Granted, Mr. Peabody isn't the same grade-A jerkhole Rick is, but he's every bit as condescending and reckless as you'd expect a talking dog to be. Just ask Snuffles. The writers of the show must have an affinity for Stephen King, because he gets referenced a whole lot throughout the series' run. For example, the episode Something Ricked This Way Comes plays as a condensed version of Needful Things, a novel which was later made into a movie in the 1990s. The so-called testicle monsters voiced by Jordan Peele and Keegan-Michael Key bear a striking resemblance to the time-eating Langoliers from the film and book of the same name. And the Lawnmower Man, which we mentioned earlier, was based on a short story written by the horror master himself. Even the title for Rick Shank Redemption is a reference to King's famous story, The Shawshank Redemption, which also got a movie treatment. Has King written anything they didn't make into a movie? As you'll recall, the plot of Shawshank involves a man escaping from a prison by deceiving his jailer, the same way Rick does in the episode. Albeit Rick does it by hopping from the body of one host to another like some possessed spirit. Because if you're gonna copy someone else's homework, you should at least jazz it up a bit. Relaxed enough? <laughs> I admire you, Rick. <laughs> If you got the Robocop and Red Dragon references and Raising Gazorpazorp, you may have missed more obscure references. Specifically, a callback to the cult classic, Zardoz. Released in 1974, Zardoz features a post-Bond Sean Connery and a red nappy. Also, a giant floating head that spews forth guns for some reason. Lots and lots of guns. That same head can be seen on Gazorpazorp, spitting out sex robots for the Gazorpazorpians to, uh, breed with and stuff. Also, this is not the only episode to feature giant floating heads either. The Gazorpians, an aggressive and violent sort, are similarly inspired by the warlike tribe Connery is a part of in the film. If you've had the privilege of watching Zardoz, you'll know it's absolutely bonkers and would not be out of place in an episode of Rick and Morty. However, that's not the only obscure film referenced in the episode. It has a similar plot to 1993's Bad Boy Bubby, wherein a man is kept indoors by his mother who lies about the outside world being poisonous. Morty tells the same lie to Morty Jr., his baby Gazorpazorp, as a means to keep him indoors and prevent him from going on a murder spree. Like in Bad Boy Bubby, Morty Jr. escapes captivity to explore the world around him. If you're a fan of Adult Swim, you've surely seen their groundbreaking 2014 short, Too Many Cooks, which starts off in typical sitcom fashion by introducing the show's main characters, and then continues to introduce more and more characters until things get a little crowded and violent. If any of this sounds like it could be a Rick and Morty episode, that's because it totally is, and it is glorious. Season 2's Total Recall operates on the same premise, by introducing more and more characters by way of shape-shifting parasites until it turns into a bloodbath. After the Smith family figures out how to distinguish the parasites from legitimate family members, they massacre the imposters with an arsenal of weapons designed by our favorite dimension-hopping grandpa. It was a fun episode until Mr. Poopy Butthole. Ooh -wee. 
a character everybody totally suspected of being a parasite was shot by Beth. Because living with Rick Sanchez means making terrible, terrible mistakes, and then drinking away your problems. We're just so glad he's okay. The second episode of season two saw the return of Gearhead. Do you even know my real name? It's Revolio Clockberg Jr. The Gear Wars aficionado from the season one finale, as well as a brief Me Seeks cameo at Blitz and Shits. It also saw the introduction of the universe's most agreeable assassin, Crumbopulous Michael. I just love killing. Who gets crushed to death when Morty rams him with Rick's spaceship. A decidedly baller move he might have picked up from 1988's Midnight Run, where bounty hunters routinely use motor vehicles to incapacitate their targets. The episode's punny title, Morty Night Run, is also a direct homage to the Robert De Niro vehicle, where he goes on the run from the authorities with a wanted fugitive. Just like Rick and Morty do with Fart, the interdimensional gas cloud that, spoiler alert, turns out to be a genocidal maniac. One of the most memorable parts of the episode features a series of fart-induced psychedelic dream sequences that pay homage to Vince Collins' Malice in Wonderland animated short. Oh, and the sequence features a David Bowie-inspired musical number sung by Jermaine Clement of Flight of the Conquered's fame. Phew, that's a lot of references for one episode. Here comes another funny. Mad Max Fury Road made such an impact, it's no big surprise the writers of the show chose to parody it in the third season. The episode opens up with Summer blowing away an angry mob of dystopian scavengers a la Max Rokostansky, proving once and for all that Summer does not need a sentient spaceship to take care of herself, thank you very much. Keep Summer safe. No, 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 don't hurt anybody! However, it's not just that Mad Max film that's being parodied. The writers also took inspiration from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, the third installment of the Mad Max franchise. In that movie, Mel Gibson's Max was forced to battle inside the aforementioned dome with a chainsaw, a sequence that remains one of the best in the franchises. Like Max, Morty is also thrown into a Thunderdome arena by Rick to keep their hosts distracted so he can go about his business, stealing the powerful Isotope 322 to fuel his tech. Not unlike how the writers steal from other shows to fuel Rick and Morty's adventures. Ooh wee! Is that show meta or what? <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but we're itching for a new season to drop. Until that happens, I guess we're just gonna rewatch all our favorite episodes. What did you think of this video? Which are your favorite references, homages, and plot lines? What films or shows do you want to see lampooned in season four? Tell us in the comments section below, and while you're at it, why not do the right thing and subscribe to our channel for more videos about your favorite animated shows?